everyone to the Potomac River Jazz Club's monthly jazz talk. We're really excited to, to have Stephen Smith speaking for us this evening. Um, our jazz club is located in the Washington DC area and uh, we have for 51 years, almost 52, been bringing um, live traditional jazz to the area and promoting education and playing and uh, and uh, people dancing and all, all kinds of, of fun um, on location. But during the pandemic, during the lockdown, we wanted to find a way to help support musicians. And we began this jazz talk featuring a musician or a music historian or such every month talking about various topics. Uh, most of them trad jazz, but some of them will cross over and and this is going to be a really interesting combination of uh, early jazz and or early American songbook and classical and stuff. So I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to hear about Max Steiner. Um, a little bit about Stephen Smith. He's an award-winning author. He's an Emmy-nominated documentary producer. And he wrote the book, Music by Max Steiner, The Epic Life of Hollywood's Most Influential Composer. Um, so we actually get the guy who wrote the actual book on him, right? So I'm really, really excited to have Stephen with us this evening. I'm going to go ahead and spotlight him on video so he stays on your screen and take it away, Stephen. I sure will. Well, thank you so much, Ellie. It's really fun. As I said, I've enjoyed uh, I enjoyed the last talk so much and I'm honored to be joining you today. And I just have to give a, a, a full disclosure here that I don't think is going to come as a surprise to this group. But today's talk is definitely not 100% 100% jazz. It is about, as, as Ellie mentioned, a mixture of musical styles that include jazz, Tin Pan Alley, and the Great American Songbook, and more. And it has what I hope you will find is some fun and fresh information on film music. And I'm referring not to the songs mostly in film music, well, some of the songs, but also the instrumental underscoring that we hear in movies and how that came into existence. And yes, I was lucky because uh, I was the first person to write a biography about the person who really created film music as we know it, Max Steiner. And before I talk more about him, let's meet him musically with a short clip from one of his best known films. And that will require me to do the most dramatic and suspenseful part of the program for me anyway, which is bringing up the PowerPoint and hoping that all the various buttons and things work. And you know, forgive me, I'm just gonna actually close it out once more to make sure that when I do this, I am choosing the option of optimizing sound, and yes, I am. So bear with me a second here. I promise it will get far more entertaining than this in just a moment. Okay, do you see the uh, Max Steiner? Uh, stop sharing, let's see, one more time. Third time's the charm. There it is. Make it full screen. Oh, thank goodness for editing, Ellie. I'm glad you'll lose this little bit here. And, do you see in a moment a full screen image almost? There we go. Oops. Do you see a full screen image without any blobs and blocks and squares on it, Ellie? I'll take silence as a yes, and if it's a no, jump in. But here is Max as music from one of his best known films. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So yes, Max Steiner is best known for writing and, as I mentioned, helping to invent the kind of orchestral scoring that we now hear from the likes of, say, Danny Elfman or John Williams. But today's talk is going to focus on a different part of Steiner's career, one I don't get to talk about very often, and that's very exciting for me to do this today. And that is the way he combined his background in symphonic music with the jazzy sound of American composers and songwriters that he worked with in the 1920s and 1930s. Very brief backstory on Max. He wrote film music for about 35 years, 1930 to 65, 24 Oscar nominations, three wins. Uh, in terms of personality, he was very well liked. He was surprisingly fun, a, a good guy in an industry that isn't always known for uh, its generous and <laughs> affectionate people. And as a composer, he had a tremendous gift for writing memorable melodies. And to give you an example, here's 30 seconds of what is probably his best known movie theme. And whether he was working on a film like that, which was, of course, Gone with the Wind, or scoring Casablanca, or working on the George Gershwin biopic Rhapsody in Blue, Max Steiner really had a genius for being able to synthesize his original music with the popular music that was part of that film. And to explain how he acquired that skill, we need to travel back to the late 19th century, definitely a few years pre-jazz, to one of the most elegant and exciting cities in Europe, that being Vienna. Max Steiner was born in Vienna in 1888, a time when the city was teeming with creative people, people who were going to change the world, like Sigmund Freud and Gustav Klimt. And it was a very exciting time for music and theater. And Max was really set up for success at a very early age. He was born into a family that was already famous for producing some of the most popular entertainment in Vienna. His grandfather, Maximilian, who he was named after, was the stage producer who convinced the world's most famous living composer, Johann Strauss Jr., the Waltz King, to start writing stage musicals, or operettas as they were known as. And the result was a string of hit musicals written by Johann Strauss that were beloved around the world. And the most popular is an operetta still widely performed today, Die Fledermaus, filmed many times. And to just give a taste of what Viennese music sounded like in the world that Max grew up in, here is an excerpt from the overture to that operetta, Die Fledermaus. <laughs> So that was Max's grandfather. Max's father, Gabor Steiner, was a really fascinating figure, another showman and really a visionary. Gabor produced everything from symphony concerts to vaudeville shows. He was so well known and successful that he was decorated by Emperor Franz Joseph, head of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And Gabor's most ambitious creation was an enormous amusement park called Venice in Vienna. 60 years before Disneyland, this was a multi-acre venue that offered a recreation of Venice, Italy, complete with canals and gondolas in Prater Park in Vienna. And visitors could not only get this kind of imitation Vienna, but they could ride roller coasters. They could listen to gramophone records that were then a novelty. And much to my astonishment, well, first there was one other thing that wasn't to my astonishment. I knew it was there, the famous Ferris wheel that Gabor installed. And that remains one of Vienna's most iconic objects, seen on many a snow globe and t-shirt still. 
But the thing that did amaze me was that guests at the park could watch silent movies just months after films had been shown publicly anywhere in the world. Gabor had heard about them and imported them sight unseen to the park. So it's no surprise that Max was interested in music and theater at an early age. His first song was published at the ripe old age of nine, I suspect with Gabor's help, and those are his parents that we see on the cover on the left. At age 19, he had his first success with a short operetta performed in Vienna. The only person who did not seem to approve of his career choice was his mother, Mitzi. And here's Max talking about that. And in this short clip, you'll hear a little of his sense of humor, which fortunately he had a lot of. When my mother put her foot down, he says, all musicians and waiters are stinkers. Your mother said that? Yeah, my mother had, had three restaurants. My father married her. She was in the chorus in my grandfather's theater, and Papa fell in love with her. And that's why I'm here, annoying the audiences <laughs> in Hollywood. Well, despite Mitzi's objections, it seemed that Max was going to sort of slide into a successful career, just as his father and grandfather had had. Then, in 1908, disaster struck, because 20-year-old Max opened the newspaper one day and read that his father had declared bankruptcy. Max was now on his own. He moved to London, and he started over from scratch. For one thing, I think he went over there to hide from creditors looking for anyone named Steiner. And during this time, Max wrote music for stage plays, like the production we see on the left. Uh, he had a great success in 1913 in London, conducting a hit musical review called Come Over Here. And this was really a, a kind of smorgasbord of popular music, ragtime, jazz, with a changing cast that at one time starred Fanny Bryce, who of course Barbara Streisand would portray in the musical Funny Girl. So now Max, who had known symphonic and popular music from the Vienna of his childhood and youth, now he began conducting music in London and Paris and other cities that would really pave the way for his knowledge of jazz. And by 1914, Steiner had a thriving career in Britain. At least he did until July of 1914, because that was when we, the declaration of World War I occurred. And suddenly, Max was an enemy alien, simply because he was an Austrian living in London. He was broke, as usual, since unfortunately he tended to spend more money than he had. And he had to borrow money and make a rather frantic escape to a country that was not involved in the war. Luckily for us, the country he chose was America. And by the early 1930s, he had climbed up again from the bottom, and I mean sitting on the steps of rehearsal halls saying he played piano. He went from that to being one of the busiest orchestrators and musical directors on Broadway, and he worked with the top songwriters and producers of the day. And you can just glance at that partial list on le at the left and you can see what I mean. I even left out Florenz Ziegfeld because Max worked on the Ziegfeld Follies. The most important of the shows he worked on was the 1924 Gershwin musical Lady Be Good, which starred Fred Astaire and Fred's sister Adele. And working on this show and others like it really expanded Max's musical vocabulary as night after night he orchestrated and conducted this new jazzy American music. And also conducting theater orchestras at a time before microphones, he learned how to make sure that music did not overwhelm a performer's speech, which would certainly come in handy later in his career. But first, here's a song from Lady Be Good featuring Fred and Adele Astaire, made at the time of the original production. Unfortunately, you won't hear Max conducting the orchestra, but you will hear George Gershwin at the piano playing his own song. Well, working
looking with Gershwin and Kern and Oscar Hammerstein and the rest at spectacular theaters like the New Amsterdam and the Ziegfeld, Max desperately wanted to write his own hit Broadway musical. But his songwriting efforts at this time were not successful. Not many of his tunes were published. So during the 1920s, he remained mostly a conductor and an orchestrator of other people's music for Broadway. And this is a, a chapter, a section of, of my book that I was really excited to, to explore and find out as much as I could about because it usually gets a sentence in whatever is written about Max Steiner. And I love the fact that he became friends with Vincent Humans in 1920. And then uh, in 1928, Vincent Humans and Oscar Hammerstein teamed up for what was one of the most anticipated Broadway shows of that time uh, called Rainbow. It, was, it came right after Showboat. And so Oscar Hammerstein, the lyricist of both, everyone was expecting another Showboat. Max was the musical director. And this show was an absolute disaster on every front. <laughs> it had a turntable set, which froze on opening night. So Max had to conduct the overture for like 30 minutes continuously while they tried to make it work. Everything went wrong. They barely got through the first act by uh, 11 o'clock at night. But that show uh, did have another reason, has another reason to be remembered. Uh, it, ca it was one of the first jobs of uh, Libby Holman who was the uh, cast as the lead. And Vincent Humans wrote a wonderful song for her called I Want a Man, which you can find on, uh, on YouTube. And he worked with the Fields family, Dorothy Fields and her father, Lou, who starred in a show that all the Fieldses wrote called Hello, Daddy. And in the pit, you had Benny Goodman. You had uh, so many great musicians, the Dorseys, others, uh, and... Um, the plot, by the way, of that musical is very, very similar to Mamma Mia, uh, but I'm sure that's just accidental. But Max really had these rich experiences working with Kern, who could be very, very tough and preferred working with uh, the great Robert Russell Bennett as an orchestrator. But, uh, but he and Max did have a productive relationship that continued into Hollywood. So many good stories there, uh, and I refer to my book for more details on those. Um, well, five years after Lady Be Good in 1929, Max got a very surprising invitation that would change his life. It came from RKO Pictures in Hollywood, and I love this ad from the trades where we see with typical Hollywood modesty how RKO Radio Pictures was introducing itself, a titan is born. Uh, RKO grew out of a couple of other studios that, um, that were fused together. And uh, RKO began working right at the, at the beginning of the talkies. In 1929, all of the major Hollywood studios decided that the silent era was past, that from now on, all of the studios would make only sound films. And that meant not only that they needed actors who could speak well, but they needed musicians who could compose and orchestrate and conduct. So let's hear from Max about how this job came about. Max, how did you get to Hollywood? On the train. <laughs> well, I mean, what brought all this about? I was doing a show called Sons of Guns, and William LeBaron, who was then the president of RKO, came just to the opening. I had an orchestra, 35 men, and every one of my men played about five different instruments. At one time, we had 30 violins, then we had 20 trumpets, and he was out of his mind. When the show was over, he came down to the pit. I was playing the exit march, and he says, Max, will you come and see me tomorrow? You've got to come to Hollywood. And I said, all right. And two weeks later, I came to Hollywood. <laughs> Well, with, within six months, Max had climbed from being just another staff musician to being head of the RKO music department. But even with that promotion, he was frustrated to find himself very limited in what he could do. Because just because Hollywood movies now had sound did not necessarily mean that they had much music. Musicals, yes, of course they had a lot of music. Comedies and dramas had very little music in the years of 1930, 31. Max wanted to bring underscoring to film. There'd been a little of it, but he was usually stopped from, from having the kind of full underscoring he wanted 
by producers who kept saying to him, but Max, won't audiences wonder where is the music coming from? Somehow they forgot that silent movies had music from the very, very beginning, but they thought that the very realistic medium of the talkies would make the uh, presence of music under a dialogue scene, say, seem uh, uh, incongruous. So instead of music and scenes like that, what audiences heard was a lot of hiss and crackle and pop on the soundtrack, which created awkward silences and really could slow down a film's pace. If you've seen Singing in the Rain, and I know you all have, you know what I'm talking about, but I will give you a real example of this. Here is a good, or should I say a very bad example of this kind of movie from 1931. 30 seconds from the RKO Foreign Legion drama, Beau Ideal, and you're going to hear some of the loudest silence you've ever heard. You admit, do you, that during the attack on Fort Zindanev by the Arabs, you stabbed your superior officer? Yes, yes, yes! Why? Tell me why. Because it was a swine, an inhuman blackguard. Well, finally in 1932, Max convinced the new head of the studio, David O. Selznick, someone who would be going places himself, he convinced Selznick to let him write full underscoring for dramas and comedies, and this changed the movies. And before we get into the pop size, uh, the pop side of Max's career, I did want to share with you two and a half minutes from a 1932 thriller called The Most Dangerous Game. And as you watch this, Think of that awful Foreign Legion movie I just shared with you and the soundtrack, and notice how Steiner makes the chase sequence you're about to see exciting. He's using different musical themes he's introduced earlier in the film. He's raising the keys higher and higher to create excitement through modulation. He's using some other techniques I'll note with some text on screen. But again, this is really a seismic leap from the kind of ancient feeling movies that they had to something much closer to the movies of today in terms of musical style. Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, at the same time Max was scoring those films, uh, he also worked on movies like this one, a very fun 1932 comedy called The Half-Naked Truth. And in this movie, Max takes a song written for the film by composer Harry Axt, a song called Oh, Mr. Carpenter, and he gives it a great jazzy treatment in the main title. And then we will hear that song performed in a key scene in the movie, one in which a carnival dancer played by Lupe Valles hijacks a Broadway show in order to sing and do her routine. And there's another reason I wanted to share this clip because the film's director, Gregory LaCava, made the perfect choice when it came to casting the conductor we'll see on screen, and of course he chose Max Steiner in his only real movie cameo. So here's the main title and the song, Oh Mr. Carpenter, from The Half-Naked Truth. <laughs> Movies also gave Max a chance to include some of his own songs, and here's a good song, or at least I think a charming song in an unlikely place, the very rushed, cheap, but somehow I think still fun sequel to King Kong, Son of Kong. Uh, Max wrote this lovely little tune called Runaway Blues uh, with lyrics by Edward Aliscu, who would go on to write lyrics for major movies like uh, Flying Down to Rio and such. But uh, I don't want to oversell it, but I think it has a very nice melody. And rather than show the clip from the film, there's a recording I like from a performer you may know, Janet Klein, who is a friend of mine and who put it on one of her albums. So here from 1933 is Max's song Runaway Blues. Oh, I've got the runaway blues I want to wander away Oh, 
I've got the runaway blues today. Don't wanna stay. I know that trains are going somewhere and steamers are sailing the blue. They go, but baby, why do I care? 'Cause none of them's going to you. I don't want the train on the track. Don't want the ship on the sea. Why? 'Cause they ain't bringing you back to me. I hear the steamer whistle crying. Ooh, ooh. It's just an echo when I'm sighing. On the sea, why? 'Cause they ain't bringing you back to me. Pardon me. And I think one of the clever things Max does is he uses that theme, Runaway Blues, throughout the movie as an action theme when Carl Denham and the leading lady are running away from the Son of Kong. So anyway, well, during the 1930s, Max also played a key role in the production of RKO's most profitable film series, the musicals starring his old Broadway friend Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. And here we see Max with Astaire and Mark Sandrich, director of Three of the films that Steiner worked on, Get the Gay Divorcee, Top Hat, and Follow the Fleet. And so what exactly did Max do as musical supervisor on this film, all the on these films? Well, he worked very closely with Fred Astaire in particular to transform, for example, an Irving Berlin song, which might start as a simple piano lead sheet, uh, into an intricate dance routine, one that might be two minutes long or run over 15 minutes long, as one of them does in uh, The Gay Divorcee. And I wanted to share uh, two examples uh, of, from the Astaire Rogers series that show how Max was also keeping up with the technological changes, because he wasn't just a good musician, but he was very sensitive to electronics and the technology that, of course, movies utilize. Uh, first, I want to show a clip from The Gay Divorcee. Uh, this is the first of the starring Astaire Rogers films. They had appeared in supporting roles in Flying Down to Rio in 1933. They were the hit of the movie, so RKO very smartly promoted them to being stars of their own film, The Gay Divorcee. And we're going to see uh, a clip of Astaire singing and dancing a song written for the film called A Needle in a Haystack. In the clip you saw earlier, of uh, Lupi Velez in The Half-Naked Truth, she's singing live to the orchestra. They're being recorded on the same track. It's 1932. They were not very uh, far advanced in terms of what they could do. By 1934, when they were making The Gay Divorcee, it was now possible to uh, be more sophisticated. And what, what Max and team chose to do in this case was they have a stare singing live and he's singing to what they called a soft piano, a very muffled piano that has uh, been, uh, that is providing the basic rhythm of the track. So Astaire is singing live, you've got a piano, and then later Max will record the full orchestra and add that as a separate track. So the music comes later, Astaire is live, and you'll notice at one point when he's singing and he turns away and goes towards the window, you can really hear a change in his voice direction. And then I just wanted to also point out that when it comes to the dance part of the song, the second half of the song, all of that is done in one full body single take, which was the way Astaire liked to work. And I just love watching him do the movements in this one long continuous take, because I think it's about as close as we'll ever get to what it would have been like to see Fred Astaire performing live on stage. So here's Max on the soundtrack uh, conducting A Needle in a Haystack. Well, I'm going to rush off to the office. What are you going to do, Guy? I'm going to start looking for her. I'll find that girl Egbert if it takes me from now on. Uh-huh. Well, it shouldn't be difficult. After all, there are only three million women in London.
It's just like looking for a needle in a haystack Searching for a moonbeam in the blue Still I've got to find you It's just like looking for a raindrop in the ocean Searching for a dewdrop in the dew Still I've got to find you I'll roam the town in hopes that we'll meet Look at each face I pass on the street For sometimes I hear the beat of your feet But it's just imagination Oh, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack Still I'll follow every little clue Cause I've got to find you It's just like looking for a needle in a haystack Searching for a moonbeam in the moon Still I've got to find you Just like looking for a raindrop in the ocean, searching for a dewdrop in the dew. Still, I've got to find you. I'll roam the town in hopes that we'll meet. Look at each face I pass on the street. Sometimes I hear the beat of your feet, but it's just imagination. Though it's like looking for a needle in a haystack, still I'll follow every little clue. Cause I've got to find you. And by the way, I should have mentioned that song was written by Con Conrad and Herb Magidson. And that brings us to 1935's Top Hat. And by this time, uh, you have up to at least four tracks that can be combined on the soundtrack. So the vocal can be recorded separately. Uh, people can sing to playback. The orchestra can be added. The taps are added separately. And in a number of cases, because Ginger Rogers was usually uh, being kept busy by RKO making another movie without Fred Astaire, sometimes her taps were uh, done by Astaire's co-choreographer, Hermes Pan, who worked on the films. So we're going to see an excerpt from the main title of Top Hat, because I think that Max Steiner's arrangement gives the, uh, especially the title song that's referenced, a real electricity with this high strings line at the top. It just shows how the orchestration that he was part of with the team and was the editor of um, really makes this music exciting from the go. And after that, uh, we're going to hear and see the Irving Berlin song written for the film, Isn't This a Lovely Day? And I like this because not only is it a really lovely piece of musical storytelling that the Astaire Rogers films did so well, but I think it really illustrate, 
it really illustrates what Max did so well with Astaire. Because what Astaire wanted to have in these sequences with Ginger was contrast. He wanted a contrast between the orchestra and then silence so there could be suddenly tap sounds featured. He liked a build in the music that stopped suddenly. He liked strong dynamic contrasts, uh, loud and soft. So Max would work with his team as, and, and they would create, as I say, under his editing and, uh, and revisions, these arrangements taking what was a you know, two and a half, three minute Irving Berlin lead sheet into these sophisticated numbers. So here's a little of the main title from Top Hat followed by Isn't This a Lovely Day?
well. Max Steiner was certainly one of the hardest working people in the industry, but as you can see from this image, he was also very playful and known for his playfulness. And he was an early example of that credo, work hard, play hard. Although he would make the equivalent of millions of dollars during his career, he, would, he spent even more. He was addicted to gambling, it's fair to say. He was supporting many family members in Austria. And by 1936, he was on his third marriage and paying alimony to his first two wives, who were chorus girls whom he had married rather impetuously. So for both financial and creative reasons, he was thrilled when in 1937, he became the highest paid staff composer at Warner Brothers, one of the biggest and most successful studios in the industry. Max's salary was the modern equivalent of nearly $30,000 a week. And here you see a partial list of the films that he worked on there. It's amazing. Not only how many films he worked on, but how many really terrific films he worked on. And not long after he started at Warner Brothers, he even wrote the studio's fanfare, which was heard at the start of most of their films after that. <laughs> His favorite type of film to score were the ones starring his friend Betty Davis. And the 1942 movie Now Voyager would be Steiner's favorite collaboration with her, not least because he was inspired to write a love theme that would have a life apart from the film. And you'll hear a little of that theme in this clip from the film's final scene. Jerry, please help me. Shall we just have a cigarette on it? Yes, sir. When the movie's producer, Hal Wallace, heard that theme, he recommended that it be published with lyrics. And the result was something that Max had desperately wanted for decades, a popular song based on his music. The sheet music sold well, but the song was not as big a hit as Max had hoped because there was a musician strike at the time and the song could not be recorded with an orchestra. But here's Frank Sinatra from a radio broadcast singing, It Can't Be Wrong. The score for Now Voyager won Max Steiner his second Oscar, and just days after recording that score, he started work on the movie that would be his best loved, Casablanca. Casablanca was based on a play that was optioned by the head of production at Warner Brothers, someone I mentioned a moment ago, Hal Wallace. 
Wallace was the hands-on producer of Casablanca. He wasn't just overseeing it as part of his job. And as soon as he started developing the script with at least four writers, he was thinking also about the music. For background music in Rick's Cafe, Wallace chose popular songs that were among his favorites. Songs like It Had to Be You and Perfidia and Crazy Rhythm. And he also chose songs that subtly commented on the story. For example, Cole Porter's Love for Sale, which mirrors the plot point in Casablanca that some women are being forced to sleep with the police commissioner, Louis Renault, to get their exit visas out of Casablanca. Now, most of these songs are supposedly played by the pianist and singer at Rick's Cafe. And when it came to casting that role, Hal Wallace had a daring idea for the time. He wanted to cast a woman. And he considered jazz pianist and subject of a recent lecture here, Hazel Scott, as well as Lena Horne. But in 1942 America, Hollywood censors would not allow the character of Rick Blaine, played by Humphrey Bogart, to have a black woman as a traveling companion. So the character went back to being a black man named Sam, as he was in the play that Casablanca is based on. And of course, he was portrayed beautifully by actor and singer Dooley Wilson. Actor, singer, not a pianist, as you will see in a moment if you <laughs> watch his hands. Just don't watch his hands. Hal Wallace had one new song written for the film, and no, it's not the one you're probably thinking of. The original song in Casablanca is called Knock on Wood, and uh, they thought it was going to be a hit, but uh, it wasn't. But it certainly is catchy, and here it is, performed by Dooley Wilson. <laughs> Got trouble. We got trouble. How much trouble? Too much trouble. Well, now, don't you frown. Just knuckle down and knock on wood. Who's unhappy? We're unhappy. How unhappy? Too unhappy. Uh-oh, that won't do. When you are blue, just knock on wood. Who's unlucky? We're unlucky. How unlucky? Too unlucky. But your luck will change if you'll arrange to knock on wood. Who's got nothing? We got nothing. How much nothing? Too much nothing. Say nothing's not an awful lot, but knock on wood. Now, now who's happy? We're happy. Just how happy? Very happy. That's the way we're gonna stay, so knock on wood. Now who's lucky? We're all lucky. Just how lucky? Very lucky. Well, smile up then, and once again, let's knock on wood. Of course, that isn't the song everyone remembers. It's this one. As Time Goes By had been used in the play that Casablanca was based on, a play called Everybody Comes to Rick's. And the song was written in 1931, 11 years before the movie, by this composer, Herman Hupfeld. He wrote it for a failed Broadway show called Everybody's Welcome. And As Time Goes By was recorded a few times in the 30s, but it was not a song standard at the time of Casablanca. Herman Hupfeld does not even get screen credit in the movie because it wasn't required. But Hal Wallace knew that this would be a perfect, the perfect song for the film. And he told Max Steiner to incorporate the song into his underscoring. There was just one problem with that. Max Steiner hated As Time Goes By. And I know it sounds almost impossible to believe that anyone could hate such a great song, but it is true. And the reason is that Max loved the movie when he, he watched it, and he was so excited to write an original love theme for the film, as he had just done for Now Voyager. But As Time Goes By, as I mentioned, was used in the play that Casablanca was based on, and Hal Wallace thought it was the perfect song for it, so he ordered Steiner to use Herman Hupfeld's melody, which was, as I mentioned, mostly forgotten by 42 as the main love theme. And one thing that I think is impressive about Max as a composer is that once he accepted that he had to use Hupfeld's theme, he wrote such heartbreaking variations on As Time Goes By that it's hard to believe that he didn't love it and that he didn't compose it. So, and, uh, and he still had a sense of humor throughout, I have to say, or at least by the end, because on the last page of his handwritten score of Casablanca, he ends with a joke for his orchestrator, Hugo Friedhofer. 
Max writes, Dear Hugo, thanks for everything. I am very pleased with you. Yours, Herman Hupfeld. I think you'll agree that he did the song full justice in his score. Here's an excerpt from the flashback sequence set in Paris. <laughs> What's wrong, kid? I love you so much. And I hate this war so much. Oh, it's a crazy world. Anything can happen. If you shouldn't get away. I mean, if... If something should keep us apart, wherever they put you, and wherever I'll be, I want you to know that. Kiss me. Kiss me as if it were the last time. Well, for the rest of the 1940s and into the 1950s, Steiner continued to write great scores for great movies. I mean, dozens of them, and this just barely touches on them. And also in the 1940s, he finally found a perfect partner in his fourth wife, a former dancer named Lee Blair, who became a loyal and loving spouse for the rest of Max's life. But the 1950s would be tough for him professionally. He was let go by Warner Brothers when, they, when he turned 65 and they were cutting back on money. His debts grew and he was slowly losing his eyesight. But then in 1959, a miracle happened. At age 71, he scored the drama A Summer Place and the soft rock theme that he wrote and wrote rather quickly, I'm told, for the film's young lovers, Molly and Johnny, that theme became a totally unexpected pop music blockbuster. It chopped, it topped the charts for nine weeks. It sold seven million records. It won Grammy of the Year. Billboard magazine named it the best-selling instrumental of the early rock and roll era, one written by a 71-year-old Austrian. And that, that little melody put Max on solid financial footing for the rest of his life. It was used in so many movies. It's been used in movies uh, to, as recently as a few weeks ago, I think. Here's a little of that theme. Today, I think Max Steiner's legacy is very much alive. His music is heard every day, somewhere in the world, and almost daily on TCM alone. 
composers like the aforementioned Danny Elfman, uh, John Williams, Michael Giacchino, so many others continue his tradition of the orchestral theme-based scoring that he pioneered. And incidentally, Steven Spielberg is a Max Steiner fan, and his affectionate nickname for John Williams is Max. And I hope you have some questions about him, but to take us out on a high note, here is one more song from Steiner's work with Fred and Ginger. From 1936's Follow the Fleet, here is the uh, Irving Berlin's song, Let Yourself Go. As you listen to the band, don't you get a bubble? As you listen to them play, don't you get a glow? If you step out on the floor, you'll forget your trouble. If you go into your dance, you'll forget your woe. So come get together. Let the dance floor feel your leather. Step as lightly as a feather. Let yourself go. Come hit the timber. Loosen up and start to limber. Can't you hear that heart marimba? Let yourself go. Let yourself go. Relax and let yourself go. Relax, you got yourself tied up in a knot. The night is cold, but the music hot. So come, cuddle closer. Don't you dare to answer no, sir. Put your baker, clerk, and grocer. Let yourself go. Let yourself go, let yourself go, let yourself go, relax and let yourself go, relax, you got yourself tied up in a knot, the night is cold but the music hot, so come, cut a closer, don't you dare to answer closer, put your baker, cook and roast, let yourself go, let yourself go, let yourself go. Let yourself go. Well, if you want to find out more, uh, the book is easily found. It, yes, it's among the usual suspects like uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble. You can get a signed copy from me at LarryEdmonds.com. And if you want to get a hold of me later, that's very easy. Just send me an email through my website, which is MediaStephen.com. Stephen with a V. And with that, I hope, A, that you're still here, and B, that you have some questions, and we can have a conversation. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so, so much for presenting. Any, uh, any questions? Welcome to chime in or uh, stick your hand up if you prefer. I'll start the questions with a compliment. Uh, Ellie has put on, on about two dozen excellent presentations over two years. This is the most scintillating. Oh my goodness! And 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 there's a better word, but scintillating came to mind. But it boy, it, it as a TV ex TV a reformed TV producer, ah. um, a news guy, um, it hit all the right parts. Thank you. Yeah. Oh well, thank you. That means a great deal to me. Thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Any other comments? I'm looking in the chat for the first time. have a time. raised hand. There. Oh, I'm sorry, raised hand, okay. Uh, Klaus's hand is up, but his sound's off. Go ahead, Klaus. Yes. Klaus, there you are. Hello, Klaus. Yes, good, good, good evening from Germany. Uh, <laughs> wonderful talk. Um, and Max Steiner has written so, so many wonderful songs. Uh, while you're away from my reputation or Someday I meet you again from Passage to Marseille or As Long As I Live from Saratoga Drunk. There's a wonderful version of Band of Angels by Sarah Vaughan. And now my question, is there a, a new generation of singers who rediscover these songs in America? Uh, or even is there the possibility to put it on CD? Because there are 20 songs which are 
remarkable and which should be uh, rediscovered. Well, A, thank you for staying up so late, Klaus. I can't, and, and why is it so bright when it's the middle of the night there? You're in a great environment. Oh, it's virtual. Now I understand. <laughs> Unlike mine, I'm really sitting in this London bar. Um, <laughs> to answer your question, I, I can only say I hope there will be because, yes, I, I love Steiner's melodies. And he's one of those people who could write such tunes. And yet even ones like uh, maybe they waited too long, but Tara's theme, they put some kind of mediocre lyrics on and, and that didn't really take off as a pop tune. Tony Bennett uh, sings the title song uh, that Max wrote for a lovely movie called Come Next Spring, a really, really moving drama with Anne Sheridan. Even with Tony Bennett, uh, that didn't take off. And um, there are a lot of songs, I agree, waiting for rediscovery. Uh, I know someone, I know, I hate to say one person who sings uh, It Can't Be Wrong in her repertoire. I think some of the songs uh, didn't get quite the lyrics that they deserved. And perhaps that's part of the reason that singers don't sing them. The, the lyrics are a little bland on them. Uh, it can't be right, it, you know, it must be right, it can't be wrong. I mean, it, it's fine when Sinatra sings it, but I, I wish somebody had, I wish a Johnny Mercer had teamed up with Max. You know, I, I think that that, that would have uh, created more scintillating lyrics. And thank you for, for giving me that adjective to use uh, tonight. So <laughs> we'll see. Uh, it would certainly be nice if they did. And and I think there are also songs that, that uh, jazz musicians uh, could interpret because just like David Raxon's great theme, Laura, you know, they invite variation and interpretation. So yeah, thank you, Klaus. Good to see you. And Deborah, I thought of you uh, when I was hearing about all the good things that dancing does, because you're such a wonderful dancer. Thank you for sticking Thank you, around. Stephen, please. <laughs> Representing the West Coast there. You are too kind, but thank you so much. <laughs> it was just so, um, so wonderful to see all those Fred Astaire dance scenes and, and to learn about more about Max Steiner. I really don't know much about him. So now I know a little bit about him and it's fascinating. Good. Good. Yeah. Good. I mean, I, I assume that he's from a Jewish background as well, part of the yeah. whole German Jewish, Austrian Jewish um, group of culture, culture that came from that period of time. I'm glad you asked about that because that is at something that for time uh, I, I didn't include in this, but that's a very interesting part of Max's story. Yes, his family was Jewish, but there was already so much anti-Semitism in Austria as there was across Europe at the turn of the century. And I mean, you know, the, the uh, 1900 turn of the century that his father converted to Christianity. His mother was, yeah, which also Gustav Mahler did in order to conduct. It was kind of like, I'm not sure it was, I don't think it was written, but you really didn't get the good jobs. You certainly couldn't build a giant amusement park in, in the biggest park in Vienna if you were Jewish. And so uh, there was already that anti-Semitism. That said, uh, Max's father, Gabor, was still in Austria, Vienna at the time of the Anschluss, and he was going to be rounded up, and there's no question that he would have gone to a concentration camp. So Max, who was working on probably 10 movies at the time in various capacities at Warner Brothers, uh, spent a lot of time and a lot of money with the State Department just to get his father out of the country. And you could only leave with like a pittance, like, you know, right. pocket change, you know. So his father had to leave everything back. But the good news is that Max arranged to get him out, arranged for a friend to meet him in New York and uh, brought him to Los Angeles where his father lived uh, into his 80s for the rest of his life. His mother, his mother passed away in 1937, so okay. right before the Anschluss. Yeah, so, that's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and Max, I have to say, was virulently anti-Nazi from 1933 on. As soon as Hitler took over, I was so lucky that, that his pencil scores survived, the ones that he wrote in hand that would then be turned into orchestral parts. And he is a doodler and a scribbler on the margins. And a lot of it is, and, and this is just for the benefit of the people who are turning them into instrumental parts, the orchestrators that he's working with, one or two people, and they're men. So he's writing jokes and some of them are you know risque, naughty jokes, and some of them are, it's studio gossip and he's writing it I think just to keep them all awake because they're staying awake for like two or three days straight sometimes to finish these movies and uh, and somehow he managed to have a sense of humor but I noticed in his 33 34 scores he starts to make 
jokes about Hitler that are kind of nervous jokes, anxious jokes. You know, he's throwing swastikas, not not in any supportive way, but it's like his anxiety just coming out on paper. And um, he scored the very first really anti-Nazi film that Hollywood made was called Confessions of a Nazi Spy in 1939. And it was the Warner Brothers who made it. They were, you know, the most courageous of the studios. And, and the head censor, Joseph Breen, was saying don't to studios, don't criticize Hitler because in the production code it says you can't criticize leaders of foreign governments. That's how crazy it was. And 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 I'm sorry to say that the major movie studios distributed their films in Germany right up to the beginning of World War II. Uh, Warner Brothers did not, and they made this anti-Nazi film. And Max only agreed to score it if he didn't get screen credit, not because he was a coward, he wasn't, but because so much of his family was still in Austria and he was not without uh, reason concerned that his family would be rounded up if they knew that he worked on the film. Once we were in the war, once the US was in the war, he really got to fight, if you will, musically by scoring things like Casablanca and so many other, you know, uh, very successful movies, uh, a movie, an Irving Berlin musical called This is the Army that Max contributed incidental music score, raised like the equivalent of a James Cameron movie box office today. It was so successful. And the Warner Brothers, who were really nickel and dimers, I mean, they ran a great studio, but they were tight. They, they donated all the money from that movie to the war effort. They were very patriotic. So yeah, there's a whole interesting story that I'm happy I was able to tell in the book about what what Max did you know and how he suffered during those war years happily his family you know the ones that were still alive made it through the war very interesting thanks Stephen sure mm -hmm. So again, thank you. I know this went a little uh, further afield than uh, past talks have done, but I'm Keep happy going. that you enjoyed it. Well, good. And I mean, he, he he lives in such an interesting world because unlike you know some composers who worked in Hollywood who just weren't inter interested in popular music, they just walk away and have someone else in the department handle that. Max is, is one of the ones like say Victor Young, who wrote so many great melodies, who could be a really terrific dramatic composer and that's a very very specific skill just because you write music doesn't mean you can convey what Ingrid Bergman's thinking you know in Casablanca that's what Max did as well or, or better than anyone but he did have this gift for melody and I think with better handling he could have had more success and he loved jazz and he loved popular music and and there's a whole story in the he oh and the last thing I'll say is that Max was I'm not trying to make a pun, instrumental in film composers getting residuals. Because as early as 1933, a year after he first started writing this kind of orchestral underscoring, he, he applied to ASCAP, confident he'd be a member. He knew everybody in it and said, I'll be so proud to join this esteemed organization. And they wrote him a letter saying, basically, we don't handle your kind of music. And he tried politely for two years, and he, he wrote all these letters I found to Gershwin, to George Gershwin, Jerome Kern, Richard Rogers, and Kern helped. Her, Kern got him in as this kind of junior sub member, and Max really started to get angry for good reason. And that was the start of an almost 30-year battle that culminated in 1960, the same year he hit the jackpot with that theme for a summer place. Finally, all the, he banded all the composers together in Hollywood. They formed various groups, and uh, it was a decision that composers would get royalties whenever the films were shown on television, because the big kind of game changer that happened during that battle was in the late 50s when the, when the studios started selling their film libraries to television, and suddenly, you know, Casablanca, King Kong were on TV every other day. And uh, and Max uh, was happily the recipient of that for the last you know dozen years of his life or so. So uh, musicians today who get those royalty checks for video games, TV music, and all that, I mean, owe him a a, a debt because he was uh, politely, firmly, resolutely determined to give musicians a better a few life. Minutes a this is why we have ten minutes of credits at the ends of movies because anyone named in the credits gets a residual. <laughs> it is an interesting yeah thought I mean, on the one hand i'm glad people get credits and we, we can leave if we want to on the other hand it does seem a little extreme <laughs> at times. they get to play two songs you know they get to... <laughs> no i do like to get I, i'm happy that we see musicians names in the credits though uh now so that's nice yeah and what a wonderful legacy i mean he 
I mean, he has multiple legacies if you think about it, but, but what a wonderful gift to leave to others. Yes. You know, there's the gift of his, of his music and his uh, skill in the movies, but also, um, you know, folks that can struggle a lot financially that, that have a little bit less struggle because of him. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. By the way, Stephen, do you know another fam- another famed composer associated with amusement parks? Amusement parks. Well, they're the Sherman Brothers, of course. Uh, but uh, who are you thinking of? Handel. Oh, oh. Uh, now I vaguely know what you're talking about. But Handel the- owned a very successful amusement park in London. He's mainly remembered now for the the Messiah, but actually the majority of his work was not religious at all. Yeah, he, he was committed and to the water music. Showman. He was a yeah. showman who put on these elaborate right. things that he had created, and he made a lot of money doing it. That's right, for King George. He had a good patron. Right. And I, I, I think there's a very... It was a very popular place that everybody went to. Well, that's that's a good subject for a talk, composers and amusement parks. I mean, uh-huh. there's, there's, there's some jazz in there, certainly if you include Disneyland. Well, and we think of composers, especially in the classical world, as kind of living in an ivory tower. But, you know, a lot of them didn't. Most of them didn't. Oh, no. I mean, as, as Bernard Herrmann liked to say, when people said, why do you write music for films? He would say Mozart wrote music for dinner parties. You know, well, good music is good music. <laughs> the, the theater of Shakespeare's time was more like Hollywood, really. And he was in the middle of that. And that was the same thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. And Jack Warner was the court composer's, uh, you know, sponsor in, uh, of Warner Brothers. You know? I mean, there's a real direct line between Haydn and the Esterhazys that financed uh, Haydn's career. And, you know, as we've said, so many others. But, uh, right. You know. So thank you again. It's been a real pleasure uh, getting to meet those of you that I, I didn't know before and then seeing old friends and, and Ellie having you as a wonderful host. So thank you so much for this. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, we, we enjoyed this so much. And uh, we appreciate everybody who uh, made a couple of people pay for donation tickets. We put this on for free to everyone, but we do take donations toward the program. Um, so if you're so inclined, you can go to our website, prjc.org, and, and there's a little PayPal link where you can chip in. And we are looking forward to our February talk. I don't want to jinx it uh, because we're still trying to pin down um, a date. But uh, uh, we're kind of doing a, a carnival or Mardi Gras celebration month. And Bruce Sunpai Barnes is uh, probably going to be our speaker. Um, he is a well-known uh, Zydeco musician, um, Renaissance man, National Park Ranger, um, Birdist educator, um, and also um, masks in the Black uh, Indian masking traditions in uh, in New Orleans. And so he's going to give us a little talk if we can get all the logistics straightened out. So keep your eyes open if you're uh, interested in, in the Carnival Mardi Gras stuff. And we hope to see everyone at another lecture. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night, Bye. everyone.